Your passcode has been confirmed. After the tone. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. It's 2 o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and get started. I wanted to welcome all of you to CDC's hemoglobinopathy webinar series. My name is Mary Houlihan, and I'm from the Division of Blood Disorders, and I will be serving as today's moderator. So as a conference leader, I'm going to mute all of the conference lines so that we can eliminate the background noise. The conference is now in silent mode. After the presentation, we will allow questions, and at that time, if you want to um, speak to the rest of us, you'll need to press star six to unmute your line. If you do have a question, you can electronically raise your hand by accessing the Q&A tab on the menu bar of your webinar screen and clicking on the hand icon in the upper right corner. That way you'll display your name to us here um, at CDC and we can call on participants as their names are displayed. You're more than welcome to raise your hand during the presentation, but we will wait until the discussion period to address those comments. I also would like everyone to know that this session is being recorded. So today's topic is beta globin haplotype analysis in children with sickle cell anemia. Dr. Christopher Bean received his Bachelor of Science degree in biotechnology from Worcester Polytechnic Institute in Worcester, Massachusetts, and his PhD in genetics from Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio. He followed this up with a postdoctoral position at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. In 2005, Dr. Bean joined the National Center for Birth Defects and Developmental Disabilities, Division of Blood Disorders, Clinical and Molecular Hemostasis Laboratory Branch, where he currently serves as the Molecular Hemostasis Acting Team Lead. So I'm now going to turn the presentation over to our presenter. Um, Dr. Bean, if you can please unmute your line by pressing star six, and you can go ahead. Hi, Doc. Can you hear me, Mary? Yes, we can. Please go ahead. Thanks. Okay, great. Thanks so much. And um, welcome again, everybody, for tuning in to uh, this, what may be a little bit on a genetic-centric, I guess, version of the DVD hemoglobinopathies webinar series. Um, I just want to start by saying I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to um, this crowd in particular and tap your expertise, because what I want to do is um, share with you some of our recent work and get your input on it um, in our efforts to try to better understand um, sickle cell disease severity. So can I have the next slide, please? So I know this crowd is all familiar um, with sickle cell disease, but I just wanted to um, remind us all of uh, a couple of key features that are sort of relevant to what we're going to be talking about today. Um, sickle cell disease is a common inherited blood disorder affecting, you know, as many as 100,000 people uh, in the U.S. And that's just the U.S. alone. Um, this is only a small fraction, uh, of course, of the, uh, the burden of this disease felt worldwide, particularly in areas where malaria is endemic. As I say, it is an inherited blood disorder. We know the gene, and in fact, we know the specific mutation which causes sickle cell disease. There is a single nucleotide change in the coding region of the beta globin gene um, and I'm going to refer to that as HBB probably on and off throughout this talk. But the uh, result of that nucleotide change is that you get a different amino acid put into the protein. Um, and in fact, there's a glutamic acid, glutamic acid to valine substitution um, in the sixth position of the protein. Um, you'll also see this written um, as the seventh position um, for a numbering system that starts at the initiation codon. But what happens is um, normally, Hemoglobin molecules are a tetramer made up of two um, alpha chain genes and two uh, beta chain genes. But in the case of sickle cell disease, when the beta chains uh, that make up the hemoglobin carry the substitution, now this hemoglobin under low oxygen conditions um, can polymerize uh, to form these very long and flexible chains um, that wouldn't normally form. And this is what um, essentially results in the high rates of the, the characteristic sickling uh, and hemolysis of the, of, the, of, of the blood cells. So next slide, please. So even though this is a um, single gene disorder, um, it's been observed that there's quite a high degree of clinical heterogeneity associated with uh, SCD. So there's a, a lot of um, downstream, I guess, uh, complications or, or, or systems affected that uh, an individual may um, experience. 
with sickle cell disease. And I've listed um, not even a full list, but some of those are here in this arrow. Um, patients may experience, of course, anemia, organ damage, splenic dysfunction, um, acute and chronic pain, stroke, uh, and, and of course the list goes on. But in addition to, to, to this sort of long list of, of different looking complications, it's also been observed that there seems to be um, quite a range in terms of overall disease severity uh, an individual may experience. So while sickle cell disease is never benign, um, it seems or it's been observed that some patients have a, a much milder form uh, and may experience um, only a few of these different um, uh, uh, complications or, or, or fewer of them over time, whereas other patients just seem to be hospitalized um, again and again um, for, say, pain episodes or acute cyst syndrome or, uh, or, or the like, and really even from a very young age have a, just a much more severe course. So we feel that, uh, and of course many people um, uh, are feel this way and investigate this, but we feel that a better understanding of the clinical variability could um, lead to improved care and could guide new treatment and new intervention development. Um, for example, you can imagine the benefit of even just being able to um, better screen for and better predict who is at risk for severe disease um, before they can have um, multiple events and before they can really begin to accumulate um, some of this organ damage. So go ahead to the next slide, please. So there's no question that um, environment and, and quality of care are going to have a dramatic impact on, on disease course and disease severity, but we're going to focus um, today on innate or, or genetic modifiers of sickle cell disease. And uh, the two really best described uh, and longest studied genetic modifiers for SCD um, really remain alpha thalassemia and fetal hemoglobin level. So alpha thalassemia, um, typically, at least in U.S. populations, typically from, uh, which results from the deletion of copies of the alpha chain gene, um, it has its own complications, but when it's coincident with sickle cell disease, these patients have a reduced hemolytic anemia. Um, this is, you know, likely due to the uh, overall less sickle hemoglobin that's uh, available uh, to polymerize. Uh, and, and similarly, in the case of fetal hemoglobin and uh, fetal hemoglobin level, um, a higher percent uh, of your hemoglobin that's fetal hemoglobin necessarily means uh, a lower percent that is the, the sickle hemoglobin, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in the next slide, but you may recall that the beta globins are, are developmentally regulated and that there is a switch um, in the predominant form um, right around birth where you switch from the fetal form, uh, which does not carry the mutation, to the adult um, form, which, which does if you have sickle cell disease. Um, and this switch is delayed, uh, can be delayed in individuals with sickle cell disease. Um, and in fact, those HBF levels can remain higher um, even later in their life than, than you would find um, in an unaffected population. Um, and I'll, I'll also just remind you um, that it's been shown that hydroxyurea therapy, um, it is associated with uh, an increase in fetal hemoglobin level and a decrease in uh, adverse events uh, in clinical trials, recent clinical trials that, that you're probably familiar with. So the third um, area, which has been the subject of a fair amount of study over the years for its effect on sickle cell disease and, and sickle cell disease severity, are beta globin locus haplotypes. And this um, is just basically the idea that DNA variation that is near the sickle cell mutation may impact clinical outcomes. Um, you know, a likely mechanism would be, you know, through the regulation of the expression of these beta, uh, beta globin genes, as I've described. Um, and in fact, um, it has been shown that these beta globin haplotypes do associate with fetal hemoglobin level. However, um, as, you, as you sort of go back through the literature over the past several years, even, even a couple decades, you find that haplotype phenotype studies have not necessarily consistently found uh, association. And this could be due to uh, a number of reasons um, that you could think of probably off the top of your head. There's always issues of, um, of power of sample size or even of sample definition or selection. Um, it could also be the way that the phenotypes um, are, are selected or defined. 
And, um, and finally, in the area that we're going to try and address a little bit more today, it could be, um, it could have to do with how the haplotypes have been defined. Uh, so, thank you. Um, so hopefully you can make this out. I think the, uh, the translation of the system, the, there's a little bit of a, a wobble in the, uh, the way that the slide presents, but um, what I've got here is just a, a short bit of background to remind us all um, what a haplotype is uh, and how they're defined um, at the beta globin locus. So you can think of a haplotype, basically, as just a section of chromosome that's being transmitted together. Um, and we can mark that with a set of SNPs. So it can also be defined as a set of SNPs that are traveling together. So rather than reading the whole section of chromosome, you can just mark the, the SNPs. And if you can see that, I've got that illustrated um, in the top box. Um, you know that we, are, we, are, we have two of each of our chromosomes. One we receive maternally and one we receive paternally. Um, and um, sort of to highlight how, what, what that means and how you could use it, um, if you can see them, there are, uh, there are SNPs in my two chromosomes. I've shown you there, the blue and the pink, um, highlighted in yellow. And so the CAG in yellow on the blue chromosome, that haplotype carries with it uh, a red T that the, the pink chromosome, which has a TAT haplotype in yellow, uh, does not. But that's just basically um, uh, what the haplotypes are. The way that they were defined um, in uh, the, the beta globin locus is by using restriction endonuclease sites. Um, and so what they did was they just tested these sites that are distributed across this 60 to 70 kilobase region of chromosome 11 that contains the developmentally regulated beta-like globin genes. Um, and to sort of give you a visual representation of that, if you just look at sort of the, what's cartooned out in the lower box, you can see that the, uh, the, the thin yellow double arrow just represents the section of chromosome 11 um, that we're looking at it's on the short arm. Um, and then the genes are represented by the yellow arrows. All the way to the right, the big yellow rectangle marked LCR is, it's not a gene per se, it's the locus control region. It's an area that's important for regulation of these genes. Um, and then as you work your way back to the left, um, you can see that we you go through epsilon and the gammas, um, essentially heading through uh, the genes as they're expressed differentially through development, the embryonic form, the fetal form, all the way down to HBB, uh, the predominant adult form. And HBB is where we have the mutation. So just below that, um, in red, uh, and, and marked by sort of the big red blobs, is the, the approximate positions of these restriction sites that were used to, um, to, to mark the haplotypes. And basically, um, a restriction endonuclease is just uh, an enzyme that cuts DNA. And uh, it doesn't cut DNA randomly, but it recognizes very specific sequences of DNA. It has to find the right sequence to bind to it and cut it at that specific site. And so you can see how it can mark differences in DNA from person to person, since changes in the DNA level can create or destroy cut sites. And when you uh, digest and then separate those fragments by size, you get different, essentially different banding patterns. And, that, and that's what these RFLP or restriction fragment length polymorphisms are. Um, and that's the way that these uh, were defined, typically using um, about six or six to 12 of these restriction sites uh, through this region to, uh, uh, to map the haplotypes. And in fact, that does a great job mapping uh, these haplotypes to different geographic regions. Um, uh, in fact, that's why uh, and how the haplotypes have their names um, for the regions where they were defined or identified and where they're most predominant. So you'll have um, Benin or Senegal or Cameroon haplotypes, which you may be familiar with from the literature. But as I say, this is a, um, a fairly large genomic region. This is a fairly complex genomic region. And, um, and this is a fairly small number of markers through this region. So the, the question that we set out to ask was, would a higher density map through here um, allow us to better define untested genetic complexity? Uh, and would that then allow us to improve the resolution of genotype-phenotype association studies? So go to the next slide, please. So to do that, um, what we're going to need is a sample set um, to study that in. And um, this is where we are very fortunate to um, be able to collaborate 
with uh, Drs. Uh, Michael DeBon and James Casella and the rest of these SIT trial investigators um, to have access to their samples uh, and their data to, to try and answer this question. So the SIT trial, if you're not familiar with it, is the Silent Cerebral Infarct Transfusion Trial. It is their NIH-funded multi-center clinical study to evaluate the effectiveness of blood transfusion therapy for silent strokes in sickle cell disease. Um, for this study, they enrolled kids, and these are children aged 5 to 15, uh, and they enrolled them in uh, more than two dozen sites, actually, across North America uh, and in Europe. They were largely in North America, but there are some in Europe, too. They, uh, among their inclusion criteria, they required that the kids have hemoglobin SS, or S beta sal zero um, genotypes. They needed to not be on regular transfusion therapy. They need to not be receiving hydroxyurea. Um, and then, uh, of course, they collected a, a wealth of, of information about these kids through um, questionnaires as well as um, uh, values from well visits. Um, and then also, they collected all vasoocclusive pain and acute chest syndrome episodes requiring hospitalization retrospectively, so, so for the past, the previous three years, uh, they collected all that hospitalization data. So for our little study, what we wanted to do then was um, uh, genotype the Dickens out of this locus um, in these kids to see if we could make a very dense map through here um, and see what that tells us about how the haplotypes, what haplotypes are segregating and whether or not um, these associate uh, with outcome. So the next slide, please. Oh, and then this slide, I'm just showing you um, some of the characteristics of the 820 SIP trial participants uh, that we did genotype for this study, so you can get a feel for what the population uh, looks like before I get too far into it. Um, there are 820 kids uh, that met our initial criteria we, because we did further restrict um, to, to, uh, to not the entire SIP set, uh, if you will. The, uh, um, as a genetic study, we wanted to get a little bit more homogeneous group and so we did restrict to just those kids homozygous for the sickle cell uh, mutation. So these, are, these have sickle cell anemia or HBSS genotypes. We wanted to exclude siblings, of course. And then there were just a couple of individuals that we also excluded um, for missing uh, data for hospitalization uh, for acute syndrome or pain. But you can see in the table, we do report the, uh, the mean with standard deviation or, or percent values for their age, the sex, the percent that has had asthma, uh, and then a, a series of steady state values. Um, and then also we show the distribution of the um, alpha globin uh, genotypes. So you can see how many have no gene deletions, one gene deletion, or, or two gene deletions. And then at the bottom, we also included um, their distribution of hemoxygenase 1 promoter dinucleotide repeat uh, classes. And the reason that we include this one is because we had previously um, implicated this gene, and in fact, this polymorphism, um, as having a role in, um, in uh, acute chest syndrome uh, in, this, in this data set. So next slide, please. So I did promise um, not to take uh, everyone too far down into the, to the lab um, for this talk, but I do think it's useful to sort of see, our, to take you along our process a little bit um, to, to get an idea of of how we approach the problem and what we saw along the way um, to help put into context um, results uh, that we did find. So the, just to do that uh, briefly, uh, the top half of this slide is a screenshot from the UCSC Genome Browser. And um, this is a great tool, by the way, if you ever need to browse the genome. But what it's doing is it's just allowing us to show you the region that we're looking at. So you can see in the little ideogram of, of chromosome 11, there's a little red bar on the P-arm. That's showing you the region we're looking at. Right below that is the blow-up of the 80 KB um, that we're looking at specifically. And again, in that blow-up, you can see the genes with the same nomenclature that I showed you uh, in my little cartoon and in the same orientation. So that over to the right is where the locus control region would be, although it's not marked because it's not a gene. But then you go, uh, as you work your way back to the left, you go through uh, HPE1 all the way over to the left to HBB, where the, uh, the sickle cell mutation is. And then just above those genes, for your reference, um, you see this sort of stretched out looking barcode. Uh, each of those tick marks represents the position of the 131 SNPs that we um, genotyped for this effort. 
Um, so you can see we're, we're trying to go from um, sort of the, the less dense map of the RLPs uh, to use higher throughput technologies um, uh, to type a lot of SNPs through to make a dense map. Um, and we achieve that by running two overlapping panels of SNPs. Um, we took data from the human omni quad B chip. Um, this is really a whole genome genotyping chip with, with more than a million markers on it across the genome, but we just pulled out, uh, for this effort, we just pulled out the data from this region. Um, we also wanted to supplement that um, with um, other SNPs that we thought might be important but weren't included on their, their sort of standard product. So we also ran a Golden Gate custom panel that had another set of uh, SNPs on there. As I say, though, these were overlapping uh, panels. They did have about 15% of the SNPs that were the same, and we did run approximately 15% of the samples with both uh, panels, um, just as part of our QC. And then down in the lower left, um, you just have an, I'm just showing you an example of what the raw data looks like for one of these SNPs. This is the cluster plot for one of those 131 SNPs. Um, and basically, if you haven't seen these before, each dot represents uh, different, uh, represents a person, represents an individual, uh, as a genotyping result. So uh, it's a, it's a two-color assay, really, because we're really only testing one or two answers at each at each site for these SNPs. Um, if you have, if you're homozygous for one of the alleles, you'll only have one kind of fluorescence, and you'll cluster together with this group over on the red, uh, they're colored red. If you have only the, if you're homozygous for the other allele, um, you'd only have the other fluorescence, and you cluster over with the blues. And of course, if you have both um, fluorescence markers in roughly equal uh, amounts, you're, you, we would call you a heterozygote, um, and you cluster together in the middle of the purple. So that's just what that, this is an example of what that data looks like. So the next slide, please. Uh, so here, I'm just trying to represent for you, um, visually, a little summary of the genetic variation that we observe, or really that we don't uh, observe, even, uh, if you will. Um, looking at the um, looking at these 131 SNPs uh, in this locus. So for this graph, I've plotted the minor allele frequency going up the vertical axis, and then across the horizontal is the SNP assay number, um, and that just means that um, each one of those little blue diamonds represents a different one of our SNPs, and I've reordered them so that they're in order of uh, increasing minor allele frequency, uh, just to make it easier to visualize, so that you can see that half of the SNPs that we tested um, have absolutely no variation whatsoever or have very low uh, minor real frequencies, less than 5%, um, in this uh, study of, of hundreds of kids. So um, having no or, or low amounts of variation, they're going to make them uh, not as useful to us to, um, uh, to sort of to allow us to delineate the population and, and test for, for important changes. Um, but we can use um, those that are above a 5% minor real frequency. Um, I've got those sort of bracketed there. And I've got an example of that shown on the next slide. So here, uh, uh, once again, this is, is going to be an LD plot or linkage to equilibrium plot um, generated by Haplivu, the program Haplivu. Um, again, at the top of the slide, uh, just to orient you, I show you the same section of chromosome 11 that I showed you before um, in the same orientation. The genes now are marked with these little blue arrows so that you can see where they are. Um, just below that are the SNPs that went into this analysis um, with these RS numbers. Um, and you can see the lines point to where they are, their relative positions on the chromosome. Um, and the inverted triangle beneath it um, is the, as I say, is have use linkage disequilibrium plot, disequilibrium plot. Sorry, I get going too fast there. Um, and what this is doing is this is showing you the LD value for all pairwise comparisons um, between all of these SNPs. And, um, by linkage disequilibrium, uh, we're using a D prime measure here, but it, it really it's just a measure of, you can think of it as just a measure of how much more frequently two SNPs are traveling together um, than you would find by chance if they were segregating independently. So the higher the value, the more often they are traveling together. And if you wanted to know the specific um, uh, value for any pair of SNPs, you just follow them down their diagonal to where they intersect. Uh, and that that value in the box uh, gives you the, the decimal representation of, of D prime. The boxes without a value in them are actually um, complete LD. But you don't need to do that or even look at, at the numbers. This um, uh, type of graph is particularly nice, I think, because it is color coded, um, which makes it really uh, you know a lot easier to see what's going on. Um, and you can you 
what you'll see is, is that the more red and the darker the red um, that you have, the more linkage disequilibrium you have. So if you're not used to uh, looking at these or haven't seen these types of plots before, um, I'll tell you that this is a very red plot. This actually represents quite uh, a lot to me of linkage disequilibrium and over uh, quite a long uh, distance of this chromosome. Um, this is much more um, this is much more LD than you would uh, expect to find if you were to have typed, say, just the general population or a group that wasn't selected to all have um, sickle cell anemia um, at the HPV locus. And if you would um, keep a close eye on um, this triangle as we advance to the next slide, hopefully you could see um, the difference between that slide and this one. We didn't genotype, so I don't have um, our own data to show you for this because we didn't genotype with our panel, anyone who, who uh, did not have sickle cell disease. But this is data from, HAP, from the International HapMap Project for the same SNPs. Um, and I pulled the data from the Rubin population. This is a smaller group, of course, a much smaller group than we genotyped uh, on the last slide. But you can just see the difference. This is much more representative of what you would expect to find or would find um, if you were to genotype this set of SNPs in the region. So next slide, please. So um, you can see with this amount of um, LD, um, and the SNPs really traveling together like they do, when you ask the question about um, one of these SNPs, you learn a lot about its neighbors and, and about what's going on in its neighbors at, at quite a long distance. And so we can select a, a set of these SNPs then um, to, to mark the haplotypes. Uh, and in fact, I've got some, these are the ones that we've selected, I've, got, I've shown you in yellow here in these circles. Uh, next slide. So what we want to do then uh, to, to, to define our haplotypes, to actually mark the haplotypes present, um, is take those SNPs and, and, um, and put them into a haplotype analysis using uh, the phase program. So the top half of this table shows you the information about the SNPs um, from the last slide, their, well, their positions on chromosome 11, um, their names, which of course are just those iris numbers, the alleles that we're testing for, uh, the minor allele and its minor allele frequency in our population. And the lower half of the table shows you the results uh, from phase. And what phase is doing is just determining statistically, essentially, um, the, uh, the most likely um, haplotype pair for each individual given uh, the genotyping data for these SNPs uh, in this population. And um, the results of that analysis, you can see, uh, are summarized in the lower half of that table. Um, what we found was, um, perhaps not a surprise to you, given, um, given what I showed you on the previous slides, but what we found was that there were three predominant haplotypes that made up more than 95% of the haplotypes that we found um, in this whole population of, of these hundreds, uh, hundreds of, of kids. Um, and I've named them um, very creatively. I've named them H1, H2, and H3 in order of, um, excuse me, in order of their prevalence that we found them in the population. You can see the next column shows you their genotype. It's also useful to name them by the H numbers, I think, so we don't have to remember this uh, string of, of, of letters of their genotype. And then you can see the frequency. H1 was, was we found about 66 or so percent of the, of the time. H2, 20 percent. H3, 9 percent. And then there's a big drop off. There's actually, um, I've grouped them together, but there are actually about 10 more haplotypes uh, that were identified that are recombinations uh, of, of the different SNP combinations you see above. Um, and they're all different from each other and different from the H2, 1, 2, and 3. They all have a 1 percent. The next highest is 1 percent or less than 1 percent frequency in the population. Some exist only as one or two incidences. Um, but I've grouped them together as others. And for our purposes um, today um, and for this effort, we are actually going to exclude anybody who carries one of these other um, haplotypes from, from our analyses. Thank you. So this next slide um, is because um, frequently at this point, um, people are wondering how our SNP-defined haplotypes relate to the classically defined haplotypes. And um, I just want to qualify this slide with, we have not, at this point, um, formally tested that, um, and we would have to do more work to do that. But this does give you a view of, of how they're lining up, because there were three SNPs that we tested in our panel that are at, um, 
uh, RFLP sites that have been used to, to classically define the haplotypes. So we can at least ask how we do there. And what we find is that our H1 haplotype um, is consistent at those sites with, um, with a, a Benin uh, haplotype. Our H2 is consistent with a Bantu or Central Africa public uh, haplotype. And our least prevalent, our H3, is consistent with um, a Senegal haplotype. And here, um, it's probably also worth uh, mentioning to you, if, if you didn't know this, that um, previous studies, studies of these, these RFLP-defined haplotypes have also found that um, in North American populations, populations similar to the one we tested, um, there are three predominant haplotypes, um, the most prominent being Benin, the second Bantu, and the third uh, Senegal. So um, that just gives you an idea of, of how we're lining up according to the, you know, the classical um, haplotypes. So how do we do then as we want, as we want to know um, with our SNP haplotypes compared to outcomes? Uh, on the next slide, here um, we want to start with, uh, we feel like the best place to start is with looking at fetal hemoglobin level. Um, fetal hemoglobin level is heritable. Um, and one of the regions of the genome which has been shown to be associated with level is uh, at the beta globin locus. Uh, and of course, I, I told you previously that the, the RFLP-defined haplotypes had been shown to associate with fetal hemoglobin level. So I've plotted for you here mean plus mean percent fetal hemoglobin going up the vertical axis. And then across the horizontal are the different haplotype pairs. Um, and what you will see is that, uh, and, and of course the dot and bars represent um, the level with standard error. The N is the number of uh, individuals in each group uh, that's right beside them. So right in the center um, of the graph are the H1, H1 homozygotes. This is the most prevalent group we found uh, and will eventually serve uh, uh, as our reference group. Um, you can see that uh, these individuals have an intermediate fetal hemoglobin level, and the uh, consequence of carrying one or two H2 haplotypes, um, which is our second most prevalent, uh, is that this is, uh, is a reduced um, level of fetal hemoglobin. Um, and conversely, carrying one or two copies of the H3 haplotype, um, the result is, is that, or the effect is that they have a higher uh, mean fetal hemoglobin uh, in these groups. And um, if you look in the table below that, you can see that each of these uh, changes is, does reach statistical significance. Um, the, the N, I should point out, the N is a little bit smaller here than, um, because we restricted this analysis to a subset um, of, the, of the SIP trial, even further uh, restricted. Um, this is about 479 patients uh, for this analysis. Um, and the reason we did that is because we wanted to use um, data from the patients who had their fetal hemoglobin level determined at a central lab, and that is at uh, Johns Hopkins, rather than um, have to deal with the variability introduced by taking this measurement across two dozen sites. Um, but you can see that for these analyses and for subsequent ones, to, um, so we don't get um, into trouble for having very small ends, as we would in some of our groups of H3 carriers, we're going to group together heterozygotes and homozygotes. So um, you can see that grouped together the, whether individuals carry one or two H2 to compare against our intermediate reference group of the H1 homozygotes. And similarly, those that carry one, uh, one or two H3 uh, uh, haplotypes to compare back against the, the H1 homozygous group. Okay, so this is, uh, I'm sorry, excuse me to get distracted, but this is very encouraging to us that it looks like we're doing a pretty good job um, defining these haplotypes and they do associate with fetal hemoglobin level. So how do we do with outcomes? I got the next slide, please. So um, this slide uh, looks, uh, well, it is uh, a little bit busy, but um, it's really just the same table repeated three times um, for three different outcomes. One for acute chest syndrome at the top, in the middle is pain, and on the bottom is silent cerebral infarct. But let me start by drawing your attention to the uh, top table, uh, and this is for rate of hospitalization for acute chest syndrome. And you can see, as I've described, uh, I've got the same haplotype groupings um, that we used for the last analysis uh, with the H2s together uh, and the H3s together. Again, here we're back up to a higher N. You'll see the N in each category. 
Here we have 733 uh, total individuals uh, because here we are not restricting on having had a, uh, their fetal hemoglobin taken or measured at a central lab. You can see the uh, ACS rate um, for each of these groups. And then um, the rate ratio, uh, crude, uh, and then adjusted, uh, in crude and adjusted models um, and, the, and associated p-values. And we used the, and for adjusting, we used the 10% um, effect estimate criteria to, uh, to, uh, to include co for, for covariates, for inclusion in our, in our models. Um, and what you see is, is what you may notice, because I've highlighted in yellow, I'm hoping you notice, is that um, those people who carry one or two copies of the H3 haplotype uh, have an almost twofold reduction in their rate uh, of, of acute chest syndrome, even after we account for the effects of asthma and gender and alpha globin gene deletion status and HEMOX1 um, promoter repeat class uh, effect on, on ACS. And that does achieve a statistical, a statistical significance of P of 0.02. Um, but and that is in contrast to what you see when we look at pain as an outcome or, or incidence of silent cerebral infarct, uh, which you will see if you uh, read carefully through the table or if you just notice that I haven't highlighted anything in yellow, um, we find no association between haplotypes in either of those outcomes uh, in any group in either crude or uh, adjusted models. Uh, can the next slide, please? So here, um, I put this in just, uh, this isn't a formal statistical analysis, but just to get a better view of what's happening in these, uh, in these, in these patient groups. So here I've broken down the groups a little bit more by their um, beta globin haplotype and alpha globin gene deletion status. So these are two um, important uh, markers that impact um, uh, severity, I've told you. Um, and I've got the same data represented on the, the graph as the table next to it, depending on which way you like to look at it. Um, I've just, and I've, this, is, this is, of course, just the data specific to acute chest syndrome. So I've, I've plotted the incidence of acute chest syndrome going up the, the vertical axis here. And I've ordered the, um, the individuals based on what you might predict their, uh, their severity to be based on their uh, beta globin haplotypes um, and in combination with their alpha gene deletions. And um, I will say that I did keep together, um, the, or did lump together, uh, individuals that carry one or two alpha gene deletions, because I didn't want to have too many uh, zero cells here. But that's in contrast to those that carry no alpha gene deletions. Um, and you can, see, you can see how we do as you go uh, uh, left to right in terms of decreasing severity on the graph or, or top to bottom in terms of the actual values. And you'll also see as we're starting to get down to some of the small ends. But it gives you, I think, a, uh, a little bit better picture of, of how these markers may be useful um, to, to, to delineate this, uh, this severity. Uh, next slide, please. So um, in summary, then, uh, we set out to create a very dense uh, SNP map of the beta globin locus, and I've taken you through our process of, of how we did that and what we saw along the way. We identified a pattern of what was very high linkage disequilibrium, um, and uh, related to that, it turned out we only identified a small number of haplotypes, just three predominant hap haplotypes that could be captured by a, a fairly small number of SNPs. However, we did find that those haplotypes had a significant association with fetal hemoglobin level, and um, we found that our SNP-defined haplotypes may be associated with uh, acute chest syndrome, but not pain or silent cerebral infarct, uh, at least in our study. So, in conclusion, our results suggest that these SNP-defined beta haplotypes, beta globin haplotypes, in combination with covariates, uh, as I've described, may be useful to delineate clinical heterogeneity. At least uh, they were or seem to be in, in, in this large study of children with sickle cell anemia, uh, at least as measured by, by these acute events. And so finally, on the next slide, I think it's important, uh, of course, with this study, as it is with any study, to um, consider the strengths and limitations and take those into account. Um, and so I've just pointed out a few of them here. 
Um, this, of course, was a large effort to create a dense SNP map of the sickle beta globin locus. Um, it was large in terms of the number of SNPs types, but, but much more so large, I think, in terms of the, the number of individuals we typed uh, for this type of analysis. Um, it, um, because of the, uh, the, the rich uh, clinical data, the fact that we could do this in the context uh, of, a, of a clinical trial setting, means that this is a very large study of the impact of the beta globin haplotypes on SVD severity. So uh, that's a, a nice uh, strength of this study. The third bullet, um, uh, this study population, it's important to point out, it is children with SCA and three years of medical history. This, of course, as you know, indicated, is a, is, is a strength um, and al allows us a lot of power to, 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 uh, to look at this group and to draw conclusions, but it's also a limitation um, and it's a limitation in terms of how generalizable this data is to the population with sickle cell disease uh, in general. Um, as I say, we, only, we restrict it to just having sickle cell anemia and, and did not look at other forms of sickle cell disease. These are kids. And um, there's uh, no question that there are a lot of outcomes that uh, would be important to look at that wouldn't have time yet to, to, to be manifest or to be, to, to, that we could measure uh, in these kids or that were measured in these kids. Um, and I will also point out that it is uh, possible that this sample set may be skewed slightly uh, towards, the, um, towards the less severe end of the spectrum, um, simply because you may recall that the inclusion uh, criteria for the SIT trial um, was that the kids needed to not um, be on transfusion therapy, they needed to not be on hydroxyurea therapy, um, and it seems that it seems at least possible that, you know, if, uh, if they were suffering from very severe uh, course of sickle cell disease, uh, these kids might have already been on uh, those therapies. So that's just uh, worth uh, taking into consideration. And so with those, um, those bits in mind, we feel that um, future rigorous studies are absolutely needed um, to validate the predictive value of these markers. And it would be um, informative and important to include, uh, as I say, additional clinical outcomes, um, we would want to look in more severely affected um, individuals and, of course, uh, older, uh, older populations as well. And uh, finally, can I have the last slide, please? Um, um, I, we would like to thank um, the families and children with sickle cell disease who were the participants, uh, of course, the SIT study investigators and coordinators, um, all of whom I didn't have room to, to list, of course, here on this slide, um, past and present members of, of our laboratory, and um, with that, I would like to thank you all um, for your time and patience listening to me. And um, I'd be happy to try and clarify any points, answer any questions you might have. And I'm particularly interested to hear um, any feedback or thoughts you might have on, uh, on this work. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Bean. Um, that was really wonderful. I think you took a very challenging subject matter and, and broke it down to a level that was very understandable, so thank you. Um, as we're now going to open the lines for questions, so you can ask your questions in one of two ways. One, you can raise your hand electronically in that Q&A tab. Um, you can type your question in or just type your name, and we'll call on those in the order that they've received. received. Or if you don't have a chance to do that or if you're not at a computer, if you want to just unmute your line and ask your question, you'll need to press star six in order to do that. So um, it doesn't look like we have any questions on the computer, but if anyone would like to do this over the phone, please go ahead. Is there anybody out there in telephone land who would like to ask Dr. Bean a question? I'll take it is that I was extraordinarily clear and not that I put everyone to sleep. No, <laughs> I have some questions if no one else does. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and jump in with my first one. Um, so I, first of all, just for those on the line for all of us, um, is this work being published or is there somewhere, or what are your plans for getting this information out to a larger audience? So as a matter of fact, we have um, uh, written this um, work up and submitted it to um, the British Journal of Hematology where uh, it is, um, I, think, uh, I, I think we've just been accepted. Um, oh, congratulations. So hopefully we'll get, this, hopefully we'll get this, this out there. Okay, wonderful. And then my, my follow-up question, so what are your thoughts for next steps about where to take this, 
data that you now have and this information that you've received and move it forward? What are your thoughts for, for going ahead with this? Well, um, you know, it seems to me, you know, even even in the short term, you know, as I say, like it would be, it's uh, this, this variability, you know, in terms of sickle cell disease severity, it can be hard to predict. You know, um, it's not, there are other, there are other uh, studies ongoing, GWAS and like, and there's lots of identifications of, of things. But, you know, it's, it's right now, the variability is not completely explained, either in terms of environmental or, or genetic. And it would be useful, I think, to be able to, even just to be able to screen for uh, and find those maybe at highest risk, to have some set of markers that were good markers. Um, so because that could influence um, how you might want to treat them, maybe more aggressively, or, the, or, or however you would you know, decide to use this information, um, you can decide whether or not it's worth it to try some different therapies. Um, and you could know that before, like I say, early on and before uh, lots of events happen and, and you start to suffer significant damage. So it seems like before you get there, though, you really have to find a set of markers that do a good job um, and, and are informative. So I would want to test these. Um, you know, either explore this region more, test these markers, like I say, in a, in a broader population, in a bigger population, and see just how predictive they are or are not. And I think, you know, it is going to be important not just to use one or a couple of markers, unfortunately. Like, it was really useful to know both, as I say, you know, this haplotype information, as well as the uh, alpha gene deletion status. You know, it was the combination of the two that really helped, I think, to, that really helped to break that out. And, you know, um, similarly, Single SNPs, you know, they, they just weren't nearly as predictive um, as, as looking at the haplotypes. That's probably because of, you know, untested, something, some important untested elements that are, that are in this region. So, you know, a lot of study of, of further study of this region, sequencing and trying to, to better understand the regulations this region is, I think, also going to be helpful. Wonderful. Thank you so much. It sounds really exciting. Um, so one more time, I'll open the phone line up in case anybody would like to ask Dr. Bean a question. And remember, you need to press star six so that we can hear you. Hi, this is Nancy Green from Columbia University. Can you hear me? We sure can. Thank you, Dr. Green. Oh, thank you. That was a really wonderful talk and, and um, very enlightening. Thank you. So I just wondered if you were able um, with the large N and, you know, careful molecular biology to, and clinical data to assess the impact specifically of one or two uh, alpha gene deletions on the phenotypes that you measured? So you mean one versus two? Uh, well, I guess the alpha gene overall and then, uh, yeah, one versus two. Yeah, so what we did, I mean, you're absolutely right. The, the alpha gene deletions um, were absolutely important. We need to, to uh, account for those. And, and when we, you know, stratified by that, um, you can sort of see the effect of it. Um, but even with this large number, um, there's really so much we could draw. We, we did. We ended up um, essentially lumping together the, those that carry one and those that carry two, even though there would be a difference, uh, of course, in, in how those, those people are affected. Um, just because of, but even carrying one, you know, seems to have some important effect because that's the majority of what we had in our population. Um, we just didn't have, with only like 5%, it was about 5 or 6% um, that carried two deletions. Um, it just sort of breaks the numbers down into, into too small to draw too meaningful conclusions about two versus one. But carrying any at all definitely made a, a difference. Great, thank you. Does anyone else have a question? One more chance for anyone to ask any further questions today. Okay, wonderful. So thank you so much, Chris. Um, this, this really, really was great. Um, quite different from a lot of the webinars that we've had, but I see that we had just as many participants as we usually do, so obviously a lot of people still interested in this subject matter as well. So thank you very much. Um, Thanks for having me. It was an honor. Great. So our next webinar is going to take place on Thursday, July 25th. It's titled Nurses Impact on the Stigmatization of Individuals with Sickle Cell, Challenges and Recommendations, and that is by Dr. Coretta Jenneret. Um, if you do have any questions about this series or about a, a, a single webinar in particular, please feel free to contact Shay Pope. 
her contact information is up on your screen right now. That's spope at cdc.gov. And also, as a reminder, all of the webinars are made available, a recording of all webinars, at scinfo.org under the webinars toolbar. Um, it does take a couple of weeks to get them posted there, but I believe all of those prior to today should now be available. So thank you so much. Um, we hope to have all of you on the line again next month, and I hope you guys have a great rest of the day, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.